I mean, Wil Wilfred, they're a $90 billion revenue company all over the world. Uh, and, you know, whether they're, whether they're using it for Chinese, uh, you know, spying or Chinese diplomacy or some, some mixture thereof, we still have Huawei and ZTE headquartered right here in the city I live in, in Dallas, in the United States. You know, they need to start adhering to our laws, and we need to bring our rule of law to them for all the global infractions they've engaged in. I'm, I'm actually flabbergasted that the U.S. Department of Justice hasn't brought uh, a, an FCPA case against either one of these companies. And I, I imagine we still can, but uh, I, I think if you just look at the facts, Wilfred, these companies should not be allowed to do business in the United States, period. I think that's fair, Kyle, but it comes on a week where the president has threatened to, to cut off the relationship with China, where, where he's questioned whether China was adhering to phase one of the trade deal, where Republican senators have floated the idea of sanctions against China for stopping the spread of coronavirus. I mean, really ramping it up on China at a time where, as I said, American companies are suffering and, and the last thing they want probably is more tariffs. I guess, look, from my perspective, uh, and maybe I look at this too simplistically, um, if uh, most big Wall Street economists say if we completely decoupled and separated from China, it would cause a 25 to 3% of GDP hit on the United States. And the way that I look at China is they steal 2 to 3% of GDP of intellectual property from our companies every single year, according to the U.S. Defense Department and, uh, and the White House. And so, and they earn profits on that theft. So I just don't understand why we interface with a strategic competitor or enemy like we do. And, you know, one thing that's not even brought up on CNBC very often is they've got over a million prisoners of conscience in concentration camps just for their religious preference. Like, I thought we went to never again after World War II. Why does the U.S. and why does Wall Street engage with such a murderous regime. I actually don't understand why. You guys are saying why now, or is it a good idea now? I don't know why we ever did in the first place. What, Kyle, do you think the likely reaction is going to be from, from China if uh, things do continue to amp up and this time there's no phase one deal that, uh, that takes the kind of heat out of the room? Wh wh where do we end up in, in six months or, or, or five years? It, I mean, I, I'm going to put the word out there. Is it, is it possible this goes to the military level or not? Well, I, look, I think there are four different wars that can be fought with China. We're already in the midst of three of them. And the, the only one we haven't been fighting with them is a kinetic war. I, I, I believe Chinese economics might is somewhat of a paper tiger. They claim to be 15 percent of global GDP, and yet less than 1 percent of global cross-border transactions settle in their own currency. They have a closed capital account. No one takes their currency as legal tender. And so... China is only str as strong as the West says they are. And so it's, it's my view that the West holds all the cards here. And what we need to do is get China to play by the global rules. They play by the, the they dance to the beat of their own drum, and they don't care about laws. They don't care about lying. They don't care about cheating. They don't care about stealing. Anything to move the Chinese agenda forward. That's their plan. And so if we start enforcing our laws against them and they start playing by the global rules, then I'm OK with fair trade. I'm not OK with the manner in which the Chinese Communist Party operates today in many different ways. The, the problem with what you're saying, Kyle, is that it's too late. I mean, talk to Apple, talk to Procter & Gamble, talk to Nike, talk to Coca-Cola. These are companies with a huge presence and business and have long operated in China, rely on it for growth. I mean, the, there, there is a global supply chain. Yes, we can move critical medical supplies back here, which would be great. And there's a huge awareness of that post-pandemic. But this is already a globally interconnected economy that relies on China for growth. Are you denying are you that? Are, I guess, are you saying that there's nowhere else around the world that can manufacture cheap iPhones or cheap T-shirts or electronics? I mean, look at the rest of no, Southeast I'm Asia. I'm sure there are even cheaper places than China. But, but it's also a consumer demand story as well. Yeah, but they have to pay dollars for it, right? We have to keep funding them with dollars. Like, they have they've come at us in so many different ways. They have infiltrated supranational institutions like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and even the WHO, which we've seen in the last few months. And everything that they do is in an effort to get all of those institutions to pay dollars to Chinese Belt and Road loans. I mean, when you look at the Chinese grand strategy and you look at... Uh, 
you know, uh, their plans for 2025 and 2050. If you look at if you look at Secretary Xi's speech from the last party Congress in, in 2017, their plan is easy to see. It's just we on Wall Street and we in the United States, we can't wait to chase 1.4 billion consumers and somehow figure out how to sell them things. When in the end, um, I think all they do is enrich very few people in the United States and they repress and suppress their own people and they don't live by global standards. And I, I just don't understand why we even interface with them, given, given all of the inputs and all the facts that we now know today. Carl, let's pivot and talk about the markets and uh, maybe start here with the, the, the S&P 500. Uh, are you surprised that the level of bounce we've seen from the lows, is it too rich at the moment? Yeah, that's the, be that's the best question of the day. I, um, I think that when you look at the enormity of, of the Fed's balance sheet and how, much, uh, Cong how quickly Congress has acted on the fiscal side, again, that's what's driven this market, right? The number one, liquidity. Number two, the amount of capital that has gone into buying corporate bonds and ETFs and bank debt and senior loans and everything that's being bought today. The Fed's balance sheet's uh, almost $7 trillion today. So that is why stocks are where they are. We just hope, and I, I am optimistic, that all of the West's talent is focused on developing a vaccine. There are 75-plus vaccines um, under development, and there are a few teams that are ahead of, of others. And no vaccines come from start to finish in less than three or four years, and we're talking about bringing one in less than a year. I hope that we get to a vaccine before year end, and I hope we find medicines that are effective. And if we do, then these valuations actually make a lot of sense. Uh, and if we don't, then the market's way ahead of itself. And so I can't give you a, a great answer other than it, today it seems to be way ahead of itself. But human ingenuity and our scientific capacity I think we'll be there, and I think we'll get somewhere by the end of the year on a vaccine. Well, hopefully, amen to that. So how exactly are you positioned right now, Kyle? You know, I'm cautiously optimistic and invested um, long the United States. And, um, you know, looking at the crucibles around the world of their interactions with, uh, with China and the leverage in the Southeast Asian banking system, we're call it long the U.S. and short Southeast Asia.